for this all year. It's almost Christmas. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Okay, gotta do some stretching. Okay. All right, can't wait anymore. Three, two, one.
You know what? I have trained all these musicians personally. Let's give them a big hand. Great job. Holy smokes. I love Christmas in Kensington. By the way, this is our 30th Christmas Eve weekend that we have shared together. It's hard to believe. Our first one was in 1990 in a blizzard at East Hills Middle School in Bloomfield Hills. Uh, afterwards, we had 12 inches of snow and the production and all the band and the singers and all of us we spent 30 to 40 minutes pushing cars out of the parking lot so people could go home for Christmas. How great is that? So welcome to Kensington. Great to have you. We'd like to point out that uh, we know a lot of you are visiting with us. We have uh, 43 identical services across our campuses. A few things that have a nuance here. And there's, uh, man, I just love what we do at Clinton Township. This is always secretly my favorite campus. And, but I don't tell anybody. And, but this is a great day for you. And I want to say, if you've never been with us before, we have a Connect card that we'd love for you to fill out and throw in the offering later. If you want to, you can go on your phone to kensingtonchurch.org backslash connect and just uh, to find out. And this year we said every person that fills out a Connect card, we're going to put a dollar towards our Hope Water Project, which we've already done about $5 million towards clean water and for wells and for transformed communities in Kenya. That's one of our 10 Global Partners, how cool is that? And you can get be a part of that by, by filling this out. Also, when we do Christmas, we want to celebrate the birth of Jesus and the perfect nature of his coming. I think you're going to learn some stuff that you never knew today, even if you've been around Christmas a long time, because Jesus' coming was perfect timing. That's the theme of today. And, and part of it for us is it's perfect timing as well. I want to just share with you something. We don't usually do this. But Stan Shilladay is our uh, audio engineer. Stan, wave from the back. I want everybody to just turn and look. Wave real high. Stand up so people can see you. So I want to tell you about perfect timing. Stan uh, married a South African. His two daughters were born, I think, in South Africa. And he took, took the job here. He's been here for a year. And just as we were walking in before the first service at 3 o'clock, he said, Stan, have you heard anything about your wife being able to find it? She's South African finally being able to come because she's he's been here a year without her and his two daughters will be dancing in the service here in a minute and right after that right as the third right as the first service was beginning day he got a message that january 16 she has her appointment with immigration services and is going to be able to come perfect timing thank you lord man it's great great news and and by the way everything you hear and enjoy stan does an amazing job he's an incredible gift so we also, if you're new with us today, it's perfect timing to have you, and we'd love for you to know a little bit more about what makes us tick, what we care about, and the fact that we would like you not just to come today, but to really join in life with us. Check out this video.
Hey, we're Kensington Church, a community of imperfect people with an obsession to see people transformed and mobilized by Jesus. We're not about rules, religion, or checking the boxes, but we're all about making an impact while chasing joy and not taking ourselves too seriously. Whether you've never been to church or maybe you've been searching for a place to belong for ages, take a deep breath and know all you need to do is show up to a service. That's it. It doesn't matter if your life is in order or what your background looks like. Everyone is welcome through our doors and everyone has a place here. When you show up at Kensington, you'll experience a practical message relevant to your life today, like how to navigate relationships and family, how to respond to cultural conversations, and how to become the person God has created you to be. We believe the Bible is more than a history book a psychology text, or a scientific journal. We believe the Bible tells us who God is and His desires and plans for us. Our hope is that when you show up, you'll experience a healthy mix of inspiration, truth, and challenge. And while you're attending services, your kids are welcome to join K-Kids where they learn about God and have tons of fun along the way. Once you're here at Kensington, you'll find lots of opportunities to get connected. Jump into a group, Bible study, or a course where your questions and doubts are welcomed. People meet in coffee shops and homes where lifelong relationships are formed. And when life gets tough, we have support groups to walk you through divorce, grief, and addiction. As counterintuitive as it sounds, our goal is to move you out of this place to impact your neighborhood, workplace, and even the world. We travel across the globe to love and care for people. We run for clean water. We fight for victims of human trafficking. We stand for the poor and the powerless. And we share the love of Jesus to people who've never heard it. Locally, we unite and empower groups of people to make a difference in the places and people they care about, like in under-resourced schools and the homeless community. We are so excited to see what God is going to do when you show up. Good. Come on, give it up, please. It's, uh, we're, I love what we get to be a part of. And I think about 30 years ago when we were starting our original team uh, of people, we wondered, will anybody even show up? And God brought amazing people. And I want you to know that if you're here today, you, the way we see you, you're God's answer to us. You're God's gift to us. We are so grateful that God has brought us together and giving us a chance to maybe serve and change the world together. So I hope you will join us and uh, maybe make this your home with us because God is really doing something special here. And I will say this, starting January 5th, I want to invite you back for our first series of 2020 called Sermons from the Seats. And we're taking over four weeks of January some of the most inspiring stories of people's encounters with a living God and talking about how that has changed their lives. So you're going to be stories of Kensington people from all walks of life. It's going to be an amazing way to kick off the year. So please take advantage of that. And at this time, I'd love for you to stand up and just say hi to a bunch of people. Wish Merry Christmas. Take a minute to get to know somebody. Thank you. So good. I love it, man. So glad you're here. I know a lot of you are here with families. And uh, I just want to acknowledge the fact that I know sometimes people are here, uh, they were here against their will. They were said, no Christmas present unless you, come to, unless you come to Christmas service. We're still glad you're here and hope you get a good Christmas present. But today, as we talk about perfect timing, I do want to say this. There's not one person here or anyone. By the way, there are people we know that are watching from around the world just want to say hi to people we love and uh, that are connected, people watching locally. But timing is everything. I mean, when you think about it, you watch, if you love to watch sports, everything hinges on the most minuscule periods of time. I think of meeting my wife on February 9th of 1979 
that um, I almost, it was an event at a Youth for Christ Center in Redford. I almost didn't go. I decided at the last minute to show up that morning. She was taking the registration. She saw me, fell madly in love with me at first sight, which you can, you can understand that. And, and the rest of my life has changed forever, right? Timing is everything. I remember 35 years ago, believe it or not, I was kind of a half-decent athlete at one point in my life, and I was uh, playing for the Livonia School Board against uh, the Detroit Lions basketball team. In the offseason, they would get together a group of players that would play benefit, and some of, the, some of the players, it's not surprising, some of the players on the Lions were also high school all-stars in basketball, and Alvin Hall was a, anybody remember Alvin Hall? He was an all-pro return guy for the Lions. If you're over 50, you might remember him. Anybody? Okay, a few of you old guys, good. You just, you just gave away your age. And, uh, and he was, I, I want to tell you something, he was a phenomenal basketball player. He literally, anybody on the school board team coming up, he could literally steal every, every possession if he wanted to. He was so quick. He was probably a, probably a nine, six, you know, hundred, and just an amazing athlete. Well, at one point I got fouled in this game and they were killing us. They were beating us by about 50 points, but I got a couple of free throws. This is my chance for glory. I want to show you know that I'm a really good athlete and I get up there to shoot the free throw. And right as I release it, Alvin comes up from behind me in perfect timing. Right as I release the ball, yanks my basketball shorts down to my ankles in front of about 3,000 people. And it's the loudest laughter I've ever heard in my whole life. It was funnier than the Harlem Grove Trotters, and it was all at my expense. And I thought, timing is everything. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it is. But you know what? Every one of us here, even those of us that are fairly young, it's probably true that almost any of us could not be here if timing hadn't worked out better. I remember in 1968, on my first trip to Lake Naivasha to fish for bass, in the, it, was a, it was a lake in Kenya that Teddy Roosevelt had stocked with, Amer, with North American largemouth bass in the, in the early 1900s. And my dad and I were going to go with a Canadian missionary named Ray Jalous. And we turned over the little 14-foot duck boat that we were going to be, the little fishing boat that we were going to be fishing on this lake. I turned it over and probably less than 12 inches from my hand was a four-foot-long green mamba, which is one of the three most poisonous snakes in the world. If it bites you, you have less than 10 minutes to live, and you basically die of suffocation. And the, the snake turned, and as it, it began, it, it, it turned. It was a little sluggish. It turned, and it was just getting ready to hit me. And Ray Jalous, this older missionary guy, had, had, had the paddle as he was standing there. He pinned, pinned the snake right behind the head against the boat and literally saved my life. His timing and his coordination, I would not, without that, I would not be here today. Of course, that could have benefited you possibly. <laughs> but you think timing really makes a difference, doesn't it, Steve? Every listen to it. Timing is, it's everything. It is. And I think the same thing is true about Christmas. And I'm hoping today when you leave that you'll believe with me and our team that Jesus coming at Christmas Christmas 2,000 years ago was an unbelievable moment in time that God used to demonstrate his love for the world. When this newborn baby Jewish, little Jewish baby boy took his first breath in a filthy barn that was probably more like a cave filled with dirt and animals and feces, who would have ever imagined that this would have been the savior of the world? In fact, think about just alone, if you're a young woman today, think about the position of Mary, who was probably 14 or 15 or 16 years old. And at that time, it was a much different world. You know, men were usually married around 17 or 18, young girls around 14, 15, 16. She was engaged to a guy named Joseph, and all of a sudden, her whole world is turned out upside down in the most inconvenient way. And I thought some of you might know this story, but just listen as I read just part of this story. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. And the virgin's name was, of course, Mary. Now, who was Elizabeth? It was her cousin, who was an old woman 
who had been barren, told she could never have children, and she found much late in life, long past childbearing age, that she was pregnant with a child that was going to be a voice for God, which ended up being John the Baptist, who was the forerunner, the person that paved the way for Jesus. And so Mary is greeted by Gabriel the angel, which he appears several times in the Bible. And the angel says to her, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, this is interesting. Mary is no dummy. Because look at what she responds. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. She's not, she's not dumb. She's smart as all good. She's like, okay, I know something is up. <laughs> like uh, highly favored. It's, you can already see her skepticism. I love that. I thought some of you are here today. You're skeptical. Welcome to the journey of faith that most of us have been on of, of saying, I don't know if I believe. So what is Jesus saying here? It says, Mary was greatly troubled at his words. Verse 30, but the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You found favor with God and you'll conceive and give birth to a son and you're to call him Jesus and he'll be great and he'll be called the son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. Remember, this is the Jew, David was one of the great kings of Israel. We'll talk about him in a minute. Of descended from him to Jesus and says, he, this Boy, this baby that's going to be born, this son, will reign over the Jacob's descendants forever, and his kingdom will never end. And Mary asks a pretty obvious question. How will this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered her. And by the way, in the Andrews version, I say, he looked at her and goes, well, it's only going to happen once in all of history. The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. In other words, God's already doing miracles. For no word from God will ever fail. In fact, if you would take that and just put that in your heart today when you leave here, no word from God will ever fail. God can be trusted with our lives. And look at where Mary says. Mary goes, okay. <laughs> She's, you could, you could just imagine her sweating. Okay, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Mary knew that this was going to create unbelievable, unbelievable hardship and difficulty in her life. This was going to be something where people would talk behind her back for the rest of her life. She was thought, I'm probably going to lose my fiance. Uh, who knows what tragedy awaits me? Who knows? what rejection lies ahead. But if this is what God wants from me, I will receive it from God's hand as God's perfect plan for my life. I love this. It couldn't have been worse for her. Can you imagine her going to Joseph? Uh, I'm pregnant and the father is God. It just wasn't going to work, but Joseph was going to put her away. But then Joseph had a vision, a dream from God. that God said, no, you stay with her because the child that's with her is from the Holy Spirit. She's telling you the truth. Added to that were all kinds of other events that I want you to think about that, we, that I want to show you and, and just to, to see where the timing was going. But, there, but she was born at a time where the king of Israel was going to hear about the Messiah, was going to be insecure. He's going to try to kill Jesus. Joseph is forced to leave his livelihood and go back to his hometown because of taxation and because of Roman uh, control of Israel. There's so many tough things that are happening. And here's what I want you to think about. How many times have you thought God's timing was terrible? Anybody want to be honest? So many times in my life, chronic back pain for 25 years, Started in the early years of this church. There were weeks and months at a time I couldn't even get out of bed. I was, I was so mad at God. Years of infertility. My wife and I were told we'd never, you'd never have children. Five years went through that. It's humiliating. Years of rebellious kids, debt, losing, losing job. You, you, some of you have lost job. You could not afford to lose. Worries, fears. And yet, here's what I believe. God is still working his perfect timing in our lives, even when we can't see it. In fact, there's a verse that I love. I've used this a lot over 30 years at Kensington. Galatians 4, it says, but when the set time had fully come, you see that phrase? 
This is Paul writing about what God was going to do with Jesus. God sent his son, born of a woman, and born in a specific environment, under the law, within the Jewish culture, with all the rules and regulations. And guess what he came to do? He came to redeem us who were under this law that we couldn't keep. You ever tried to do everything right? How'd it work out for you? Not too well. But he came to redeem us, to buy us back, to find what was lost and to bring it home, bring it home safe. And then to give us adoption into his family. In the last service, uh, as I finished the service, I had some of my grandkids here. And I had two of my grandkids were sitting right here. So I brought them up on the stage to sing the last song and introduce them. I didn't realize three, three of my other grandsons were in the back running around in the, green, in the great room back there and watching the service from back there because they're kind of crazy. And I, because I had brought them all up and created a scene because they're my, they're my gang, you know, they're my, they're my people. And two of those boys were adopted into our family. And they are a treasure of our lives. This is just the right time for us. And I thought so much more so that Jesus said, I want coming for you because I want you and my family. Some of us grew up in religious environments are like, God's after you. God's pointing the finger. God's for us. God's man at you. No, Jesus came. He came to find us. And I love this world. It just basically says when the right time had come, God came and did this. So did you ever stop to think about what was happening in history that actually made Jesus coming 2,000 years ago the right time? I want to show you a video that we got to put together that really explains some things. And some of these things you've never known. You're going to enjoy this. Before we do that, we're going to receive our offering. And I want to say at the end of 2019, thank you for you guys have given faithfully and lovingly. And most of you give online. And some of you are going to give today. This is an incredible thing. For those of you that filled out a Connect card, we'd love for you to throw that in the offering pouch at this time, or take it to the hub, which is our information center in the middle of the lobby. And uh, for those of you visiting, you're welcome to give, but that's not our ultimate goal for you. Our ultimate goal for you is that you'd be a part of this journey as we really seek to give everything we've got to see the world know that Jesus is alive and that he loves people, that he loves all people. This is a pretty cool way to live. And so as we receive that offering, and uh, that's going by now, I'd love for you to look at this story that really describes the perfect timing of Jesus coming. December 25th is one of the most well-known dates around the world, Christmas Day, the day that Jesus was born. Now about that, Jesus was not actually born on December 25th. No one knows the exact date he was born, but the best educated guess we have is sometime in September. I mean, can you imagine celebrating Christmas before the leaves even fall? Most of the holiday music would have to be rewritten, but the actual day and time Jesus was born is not nearly as important as the timing of Jesus's arrival. So let's back it up a millennium or so. From 1700 to 1300 BCE, the Israelites are enduring 400 years of slavery and cry out for a savior. God gives them Moses. Great guy, did a ton of incredible things, but Moses is not the Messiah. The timing wasn't right. From 1000 to 930 BCE, the people begged God for a king, so God gave them one. Wrong king. That's better. King Saul. Didn't work out so well. But then King David, followed by King Solomon, took over. It was glorious, but they were both deeply flawed, which led to a divided kingdom. The timing wasn't right. From 586 to 538 BCE, the Israelites are captured into slavery by the Babylonians, and they cry out for a savior. Cyrus the Great defeats the Babylonians and allows the Israelites to return back to Jerusalem. But Cyrus is not the Messiah that people have been waiting for. The timing wasn't right. So how about the Romans taking over and putting the nation of Israel under great oppression? Well, it sounds awful, but believe it or not, the timing was right. Here are a few reasons why. For the first time in history, the Mediterranean world, the cradle of civilization, was unified. The Romans had constructed the famous Roman roads, 
You know, like the saying goes, all roads lead to Rome. So this allowed messengers to travel safely with news and ideas. Ships too had come of age. Several nations shared the highway that the Mediterranean Sea had become. This was yet another means for the message of Christ to spread far and wide. There's also this thing called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace that had lasted over 200 years. So Jesus was born when this began and it meant a relatively calm environment for his arrival. The Romans were permissive about religions as long as there wasn't any trouble and the Jews had paid a nice little tax. Stability and relative tolerance opened the world to the spread of a new idea. Roads and shipping lanes made it happen quickly and efficiently. But there was another key factor, language. For many years, people almost everywhere continued to speak Greek. This shared language made it possible for Paul and others to travel to many countries and tell people the good news of Jesus without cumbersome translation. In the Old Testament, there are approximately 65 direct predictions about the coming of the Messiah. And one of those predictions is in the book of Micah. And it said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, which sounds great and all, but Joseph and Mary were in Nazareth 70 miles away. So here's what happened. Caesar Augustus started this thing called the beautification program. Basically, he wanted statues of himself all over Rome. And the program needed money. And the best way to get money was to tax the people. Caesar issues this decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world so that more people in the books, more people paying taxes. So everyone went to their own town to register. So Bethlehem was the birthplace of Joseph's father. And so Joseph and Mary needed to head to Bethlehem, arriving just in time for the birth of Jesus. Like the gears of a small Swiss watch, God orchestrated all of it. Governments, travel, arrogant leaders, prophecies, and even taxes. God maneuvered all of them perfectly over thousands of years for this one event. It was perfect timing. Man, I love that. Uh, some of you may have, some of you have done this with me, but some of you may have a chance to go to Israel with me or our team someday and to see Bethlehem and to see the shepherd's fields where we think the angels appear to the shepherds and you realize in this backwater place within the shadow of where King Herod had actually built a mountain kingdom near there in a in a time when Caesar Augustus was planting statues of himself all over the known world, including in, in Israel, where, that proclaimed him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And who would have thought that this little baby born in a barn was the true King of Kings? It's amazing when you think about it, and you think about Jesus coming in complete powerlessness. Added to this perfect timing, over the next 300 years, the Roman world would persecute believers in Jesus Christ and would execute tens of thousands of them. There would be 10 major persecutions across this cradle civilization of central, of southern Europe and northern Africa. And all of this persecution would do nothing but send the message of Jesus to the whole world. It's incredible, on its way to us. And so, what does this mean for you and me? It means that this same Jesus is here today saying to you, I know your life. I know your heartache. I know all the things about you and your life and your situation that don't feel right right now. Some of you have lost loved ones. Some of you have tremendous health concerns. Some of you are worried about your employment. You're worried about your children. There's addictions or there's things that are tearing your family apart. And Jesus, this same Jesus says, I know your life. I came for you. I think about all of the times that God met me along the way, and he's saying, you don't need to clutch, and you don't need to manipulate. You can trust me. In fact, there's another verse that follows up not just the birth of Jesus, but the life of Jesus in Romans chapter 5, where it says, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely... Will anyone die for a righteous person? Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What's the point? The point is Jesus came to be born into this world at just the perfect time to communicate to us, to say, I'm not coming to judge you. I'm coming to redeem you. 
And even though you're far away, and even though you have so many flaws and broken parts, I'm going to come and I'm going to bring my forgiveness to you. This is what Christmas means to me. This verse is what really brought me to Christ as a young teenager. At just the right time, when I was powerless, I realized that Jesus Christ had died for me. And that changed my life. I thought it's changing lives of people everywhere. In fact, this where it says at just the right time in this verse, there's a word that we use at Kensington through the years. It's called the, the, the word time. And, and in the Greek word here is the word kairos. It's not the kind of TikTok time of your watch. Do, do watches even TikTok anymore? Is, that's a thing of the past. I don't even know. Yeah, whatever. Can anybody help me? Some still TikTok? Okay. Kids that are five years old, TikTok, what's he talking about? Well, it's a long story. Okay. This time simply means the decisive moment, the critical moment when everything comes together. It's like all the parts come together and it's the right moment. This is the kairos. And what Jesus is saying is that he's the right moment. He's the decisive moment in all of history because he has because he came and he has the power to transform life. And I want you to think about this simple quote that we're using at Kensington this weekend across all of our campuses. It says, sometimes when it feels like God was absent, the minute you needed him, it's because he was there creating the moment that would transform you. Now, every one of us has to learn this the hard way. You think, well, you cried out, it feels like he didn't answer. I had chronic back pain for 20 years, sometimes in bed for weeks and months at a time. And I felt like God had abandoned me. When we were told we wouldn't have children, I'm like, God, where are you? When my kids rebelled, which was so crazy because I was like the perfect father, never even made a mistake. That's funny. Too many, there's too many guests here today. Yeah, people are like, well, this guy's weird. No, I was I had so many regrets about my parenting. And, and all this time, I'm like, God, where were you? I thought you were going to be there for me. But God was there at the ultimate decisive moment. And he continues to show up in our lives. Just like for Stan tonight, finding about his wife. He's, it's been a difficult year, but God has not abandoned him or his family. And neither has he abandoned you. And whoever you are. There are stories that we love to tell because they're our story. And today, I want to give you an image of a, just an amazing story. A, a guy named Joe Gilmore. He's, a, he's just a Kensington guy. And yet, his circumstances of birth were almost as strange as Jesus and Mary. Very similar story. And yet, he was learning all along the way that God's love had come for him, that God's timing was working in his life, even in all kinds of difficulties along the way, that God at the right time was meeting Joe and is ready to meet you and me. So let's listen to his story. I've had this persona of my whole life, like I've tried to guard the world from that part of my life. And it was like I, what I wanted the world to see, you know, of my life, and then going back to what really happened. I was born to a 14-year-old drug addict. So the first few years of our lives were on the streets. Uh, I saw things and, and uh, went through things that I don't think any kid should ever go through. My mom would had kind of come through a, a space of where she was trying to clean herself up a little bit. And, and for the first time in a long time, um, we actually had a place to, to live. The neighbor, the lady that lived next to us, would watch me on Wednesday nights. And she started going to this church. And it was, you know, really great. You know, as a child, all I knew was there were people there that were kind, compassionate, caring. In particular, there was one guy there that was really, uh, just really kind to me and nice. And I went home and I told my mom about him. And, and uh, you know, she agreed to come to church with me to, uh, to meet this guy, and who eventually ended up being my dad. Unfortunately, my mom couldn't beat those addictions, and I think that she had to go back to, uh, you know, to living that, that, that life that, that she just couldn't seem to beat, and she ended up leaving him. You know, she, she took me with her, and I just didn't want to be with her. I wanted my family back. And so there was a point 
where she took me back to my dad's house. And I'll never forget standing in that driveway um, and just, you know, pulling up there and standing there. And she's uh, basically set me on the doorstep and told my dad if, you know, I don't really want him anymore. So either you take him or I'm going to put him up for adoption. You know, it, it got to the point where I couldn't amass enough things to, to feel whole. It's like I'd, I'd get in a suite here or a suite at a, at a venue, uh, at the Lions or at Michigan Stadium or uh, the Auburn Hills, the Pistons. And I, I remember vividly um, standing out on this, this suite and, and watching a basketball game. And I just, I can really remember what I was wearing, you know, and I just remember standing there thinking, you know what, I don't even like basketball. <laughs> I'm not even a fan. I have this suite because it's what I want people to see and I want them to see me standing out here. One night I came home from work and I had just finished a long day. I was tired, exhausted. And it just kind of hit me. It hit me almost like a ton of bricks, like, like something fell on me. <laughs> and I kind of fell to my knees and I actually have ended, ended up on the ground in a fetal position. Uh, and I know that the Holy Spirit was breaking me at that point. Uh, and I just couldn't do it anymore. I know that I couldn't do it anymore on my own. I was, I was convicted that I had been chasing all the wrong things uh, and just, not on God's path and not on what he wanted for me in my life. I was a, a strong guy. I was, I was a, a powerful entrepreneur, you know, and to be curled up on the closet floor uh, was humbling. I had started attending church again uh, on a regular basis uh, and eventually met my wife. So as our journey here at Kensington continued, uh, we got more involved, my wife and I did. One of the, the directors here came to me and, and offered me the opportunity to get into the live training, um, which was absolutely amazing. Uh, it was just a great journey of, of finding out where God is in your journey um, and where he wants you to, to move out to. In one particular exercise, we were to go back to the time where we first felt any worthlessness. For me, it was the worthlessness. When would I feel worthless for the, one of the first times in my life? And I thought back to that time when my mom dropped me off at my dad's house. The second part of the exercise was that you zoom out of it now and see where was Jesus in that moment or how did he lift you out of that moment? I remember zooming back and, and putting myself back in that situation. And instead of my mom grabbing me by my shoulders, I saw Jesus grabbing me by my shoulders and he put me on that step and he said, take care of my son, just take care of him. I'm going to take him from this situation. He's not going back to it. And I'm going to put him in a situation that I can use him later. All those times in my life, as I look back of, of, of those bad situations and then to zoom out and see where he was in it. It's amazing. He's there. He's never, ever left me. Consequently, uh, you know, as I've, I've gone through this faith journey, and, and, and quite frankly, you know, there's just been some business decisions too that, that have taken me to the point of, of uh, not being an owner anymore. Uh, I got out of my last dealership, and you know, I didn't know where God was really pointing me. Uh, I took some time to really think about that and, and pray on that and reflect a lot on it. So I got approached by a, a friend of mine to go and visit a group over on the west side of the state and, uh, and really wasn't looking for a job at the time. I remember meeting with them afterwards and, and one of the owners asked me, he said, you know, so what's next? What do you want to do with your career? Where, you know, it was almost like an interview, so to speak. And, uh, and I said, you know what, I just want to advance God's kingdom. I remember driving home and I'm talking to my wife on the phone. She asked me, she said, how's it go? How'd it go? You know, how do you think it went? And I said, well, I don't know. I don't, I don't think, you know, I, I don't think they really heard what they wanted to hear from me, you know, um, but it's okay, you know, so I, I was at peace with it and, and, and uh, 
I remember getting home and, and talking to them later and they're like, yeah, they like you to come help us out so like really <laughs> you know I, mean, I, I thought I blew that one <laughs> uh, I'm a director with their company now um, you know I've, I've, I've taken over a pretty big role in their company God has just completely um, put people in my path uh, for me to be able to uh, to tell my story I've been able to witness and advance God's kingdom and talk about the things that, you know, that I've gone through and the pitfalls that I fell into in my career. But I think when you uh, step back and you really look at where you are uh, in any of those situations, if we're sitting here today, we're probably on our way or at least we're in a safe place. And, uh, you know, I think whatever situation you're in, he's lifted you out of it and he's sat you right here. Amazing story. Wow. Whatever, Joe says, whatever situation that you're in, Jesus is ready to lift you out of that situation. I mean, can you imagine being born to a 14 year old drug addicted girl who probably loved you but knew that she couldn't take care of you and the heartache? I think of Joe being walked to a porch, probably not that unlike this by his mom to be given away and to say, am I worth anything? And all these years later to see that Jesus is saying, Joe, your worth is of infinite value to me. Like there's not one person in this room, I, I don't care what your situation or what you've done, that Jesus says you're worth so much to Jesus that he would have come and he would have given you everything that was him to pour into you, to give you life and chance and new life. And we're going to kind of move into the end of this service. And Aaron has written a song that really expresses this today of the whole idea of Jesus coming to find us. And I thought about this theologically. Almost every religion of the world puts the pressure on each of us to find our way to God. Like, work your way. Be good enough. Figure out where God is and find him there. But Christmas Day stands in unique contrast to that across the whole world and the universe. That it says, God didn't say, come find me. God says, when the time had come, I sent my son to find you and to make you his own. you my whole world was a combination of events without cause wondering in a direction that I could not find I was searching for a reason to press on longing just to make the darkness fade yet in my own strength I always Seem to come up short But then you stepped into my reality With the force of love to change history You made my world stand still As you introduced me to grace To grace And just like that Waltz through time. You take my hand, show me what's yours, and make it mine. You free my soul, call me your own. You know exactly how to make life beautiful. You're beautiful In a world full of hurt and pain Many wondering where will hope come from 
Distractions from every angle. When will it make sense? My chaos is at its highest. All my joy seems to reach its lowest point. I'm tethered to the weight of worry with no escape inside. But then you stepped into my reality with the force of love to change history. You made my world stand still as you introduced me to grace, to grace. And just like that, you walk through time. You take my hand, show me what's yours and make my soul you call me your own you know exactly how to make life beautiful you're beautiful you're always forward never back you see beginning to the end story so unique I still can comprehend magnitude of your heart and there's still more in store you know every star by name but thought my life's worth coming forward with coming forward worth coming for and just like that you walk through time you take my hand show me what's yours and make in mine you free my soul you call me your own you know days, Caesar Augustus made a law. It required that a list be made of everyone in the whole Roman world. It was the first time a list was made of the people while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone went to their own town to be listed. So Joseph went also. He went from the town of Nazareth into Galilee to Judea. That is where Bethlehem, the town of David, was. Joseph went there because he belonged to the family line of David. He went there with Mary to be listed. Mary was engaged to him. She was expecting a baby. While Joseph and Mary were there, the time came for the child to be born. She gave birth to her first baby. It was a boy. She wrapped him in large strips of cloth. Then she placed him in a manger. That's because there was no guest room where they could stay. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby. It was night, and they were taking care of their sheep. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid, I bring you good news. It will bring great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. Here's how you will know I am telling you the truth. You will find a baby wrapped in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a large group of angels from heaven also appeared. They were praising God. They said, May glory be given to God in the highest heaven, and may peace be given to those he is pleased with on earth. The angels left and went to heaven. Then the shepherds said to one another, 
Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby. The baby was lying in the manger. After the shepherds had seen him, they told everyone. They reported what the angel had said about this child. All who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary kept all these things like a secret treasure in her heart. She thought about them over and over. The shepherds returned. They gave glory and praise to God. Everything they had seen and heard was just as they had been told. And just like that, you walk through time. You take my hand, show me what's yours and make it mine. You free my soul, call me your own. You know exactly how to make life beautiful. You're beautiful. I think uh, this is going to be a new Christmas song memory for me of this image that Aaron's writing of God waltzing through time to find me. <laughs> there are so many times in my life where, in, like Joe, at different levels, I felt worthless, felt like my life didn't matter, only to realize that there is one person coming to find me, not leaving me alone. And I tell you, the truth of it is, you could just think this is a joke or throw it in Jesus' face. It won't stop him from searching for you, reaching for you to take you, to show you what is his, and to make it yours. Like to give you his life and his freedom and his forgiveness. And I thought, what, what better day than there could be today than for you to say on this December 23rd, 2019, with friends at Kensington, to say yes to Jesus Christ with your life. I mean, really say yes. Say, I'm not playing a game anymore. I'm admitting I need the intervention of a Savior who would come and find me. Someone who's not telling me to jump higher or run faster or be stronger, but someone says, I'll come and find you in your most vulnerable place and I'll love you and I'll wrap my arms around you and I'll give you my strength and I'll never let you go. I mean, honestly, will you ever have a better offer than that? Jesus Christ said, I love the world so much that I gave myself that you could know and have life and have it to the full. That's what Jesus offers. And as we move into just a, a final moment where we get ready to light our candles, it's always, uh, it's hard for me. I was thinking about it today, 30 years of seeing maybe hundreds of thousands of people light candles over these 30 years be 50,000 people at our campuses this year. 50,000 people that'll say, Jesus, at least hold a candle. Impossibility that Jesus is the light of the world. <laughs> that Jesus loves. That he came for all mankind and had a desire that no one would be left behind. That he hung on a cross, was buried as a criminal defeated death forever so that we wouldn't have to be afraid. And so as Gabriel says to Mary, Mary, don't be afraid. Jesus says to you, you don't have to be afraid anymore. You don't have to be afraid of death or the circumstances of your life because I'm with you every step of the way. Even if it's not the way you picked it at the right moment, the decisive moment, you'll know I've been with you all along. Let's pray together. Father, in this moment, I just, I fold my hands in reverence that you would come for me 
in all of my flaws, all of my selfishness, all of my blindness, you'd come to find me. And I think there are so many wonderful people here that, you, that have never fully known that you came to find them and love them with an everlasting love. And so, Jesus, I just pray right now that there are some people today that would say yes to you really for the first time to say, Jesus Christ, I receive you into my life. That's all you need to say. Jesus will come in and will never let you go to simply say, I need you. I want you. Come into my heart. Lord, if there's anybody praying that today, just fill them with a sense, a visceral sense at the deepest level of their being that you're here, you love them, and that they're a new person in you, that you came to adopt them into your family, your forever family to say yes to Jesus once and for all, December 23rd, 2019. Let this be true. And while, if you just would keep your eyes closed for a minute, I'm just curious, I'm just gonna block the light a bit. If you prayed that, if you just, if maybe this is the day where you're receiving Jesus for the first time to say, I'm Jesus Christ, I'm receiving you as my king, as the answer to me. You came to take me, to show me what is yours and make it mine. Would you raise your hand? Just, I know, this eyes are closed. Just would any, any hands out there or people that have made that decision today, okay? See a few hands out there. Anybody over here? Okay, cool. Okay, you can just look up. I just want you to know something. Jesus Christ will never let you go. He came to find you and to make you his And I want you to know that this is a place that as long as it stands, as long as we gather, will be a place that says you are of infinite worth to Jesus Christ. And God would do anything to find you and bring you home. So here's how we're going to finish the service. We're going to light a candle. And uh, you kids out there want to light a candle? All right, I hear you. I got a candle I'm hoping is going to last me I'm hoping it's going to last me through this. But there's, come on, baby, cheer it on. There is a beauty in lighting a candle because Jesus said in John, about Jesus in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. And the Word was the light of the world, the light that came into the world and darkness couldn't understand it. Like the darkness always thinks it's got a better plan. But Jesus comes and he shines a light. And I was thinking today, all over the world, Kensington and millions of churches like us, people are going to light a candle and say Jesus Christ is alive and that life matters and that we're not alone. And you know what's cool? Even if it's one light, one candle, you could see it for miles. It's amazing the power of light in the darkness because darkness is really nothing but light. Light came and shone at the perfect time. And Jesus came for us. So as we light this, I want to just encourage you. Sometimes people will pull out their own like special handy-dandy lighter and light their candle. I want you to wait, and I want you to watch, and I want you to feel the movement of the light as it comes from the front to the back of Jesus Christ alive and moving in the world and doing unbelievable things everywhere in the world, and we are a part of it.
Go ahead and raise your candle. In my life, there are a few things more beautiful. Because I thought, what if each of these candles represented Jesus Christ moving in us? That somewhere at Kensington, in this holiday, Joe Gilmore is going to raise a candle. Your child is going to raise a candle. Maybe your son or your daughter is going to change the world for Christ. They don't even understand fully who Jesus is today, but Jesus is the light of the world. He says, I shine in the darkness, and the darkness can't stop it. What if Jesus is powerful enough that we know that we're loved and that we're new because Jesus is alive? This is what begins today, and it spreads to the world. Now, I just really believe this. I believe that Jesus Christ came so that you could light a candle in his name, that you would know that the light represents the fact that your love beyond all description, that no, no one could ever take it away, no one could ever 
could ever denigrate you or stop you or, or say that Jesus Christ is not the lover of your soul. And so remember this in the dark days to come, that Jesus Christ is alive and that he's working and that there are communities like this everywhere in the world that want to see Jesus celebrated in his life made known in the hearts of people. Okay, You can blow out your candle. It's good. Look around you. There are kids that won't blow it out. I see them. I see in the back. Always waiting. So fun. You know, I want to share something. Just, just hit me about perfect timing. You know how the video described the perfect circumstances for Jesus to come. Do you know that um, we've been digging wells in Kenya because that grew out of a friendship that I had with a Pocod tribesman. We went to seminary together in Chicago 35 years ago and that God opened up something that could have never happened ex except his perfect timing, which has allowed us to bring clean water to 500,000 people that would probably be dead now. And it was God's perfect timing. I think of the movement of Christianity in China where in the 50s, Mao Zedong and the Communist Party wiped out Christianity in China. Two million Christians were either killed or imprisoned. And now today, the underground church of China that went from nothing in the late 50s to 120 million believers today. This is all because God's timing is never what we think but it's exactly what we need and at the right time. And I believe God, I'm praying that you're gonna sense Jesus Christ meeting you this year like any, any other time. And we wanna finish today because one of the things when you invite Jesus in is joy. That was a big change in my life. I went from melancholy to joy. All of a sudden there was a, a joy that hadn't been in my life before. What a perfect way to end this day by singing joy to the world. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature
Merry Christmas, everybody. Now listen, starting on January 5th, sermons from the seats. We're gonna tell some of the great stories of Jesus showing up in people's lives, moving in the stories of his life. And I gotta tell you, the greatest things that are happening in Kensington are happening by people in the seats stepping out and moving along the way. If you, if you need somebody to pray with you, we'll have a prayer team tonight. If you've got a connect card, turn it in down here and we have a gift for you. We also have gifts at the hub. We got a great year plan, and you have honored us with your presence. And I tell you, Jesus came at just the right time. Merry Christmas. See you.